scriptures of antiquity, gems of knowledge carved into clay tablets 4,000 years old. The Atrahasis, the protagonist of the 18th century B.C. Akkadian epic recorded in various versions on clay tablets. Now, the Atrahasis tablets include both a creation myth and a flood account, which is one of the three surviving Babylonian deluge stories. The name Atrahasis also appears on one of the Sumerian king lists in the times before. The flood. The oldest known copy of the epic tradition concerning Atrahasis can be dated by Colophon scribal identification to the reign of Hammurabi's great grandson, Ami Saduka, all the way back 1646 BC. Various old Babylonian fragments exist that continue to be copied in the first millennium B.C. The Atrahasis story also exists in a later fragmentary Assyrian version having been first rediscovered in the library of Ashurbanipal. But because of the fragmentary condition of the tablets and ambiguous words, translations had been uncertain. Its fragments were assembled and translated first by George Smith as the called an account of Genesis. The name of its hero was corrected to Atrahasis by Heinrich Zimmern in 1899. Now, here's what's really cool about these clay tablets that are 4,000 years old, practically. You've got the main players that are listed through other various Sumerian recordings and ancient tablets of antiquity, Anu, Enki, Enlil, Ishtar, Marduk, and many other players. Now, one thing fascinating is I've read this several times since yesterday, and I'm going to read it to you guys here in a minute, and I'd love your take on it. It has a lot of connections if you read the Epic of Gilgamesh. If you read the Bible, even the translations that we have access to now that have been just pillaged and sculpted and molded and retranslated various times to fit certain agendas and ideal, ideal, <laughs> ideology, ideology, damn it, what is wrong with me right now? I'm getting a harp on literally from Alaska. Ideology, thank you. <laughs> na, 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 na. Have you been drinking? Well... I haven't been drinking alcohol. I am drinking a really good San Pellegrino soda right now. Blood orange. Nanu, nanu, nanu. Maybe I need another drink of this. Sorry about that, folks. Play that reverse and it'll have its own meaning. Now, tablet one, because there's multiple tablets of the Atrahasis. And Tablet 1 contains a creation myth about the Sumerian gods Anu, Enlil, Enki, gods of sky, wind, and water. When gods were in, in the ways of men, the sky is ruled by Anu, earth is by Enlil, and the freshwater sea by Enki. Well, who controls planet Earth in the New Testament, folks? Who runs the world according to most Christian scholars. The devil, right? Satan. Satan. Saturn. Cult of Saturn. Enlil. Are they one in and of the same? I don't know. You tell me. Enki is controlling the waters. Makes me think of Leviathan. And then Anu controlling the air... Well, that makes me think of Lucifer, at least in the Christian ideology, because many people think that Lucifer is the one that controls the air, right? Maybe I'm wrong here. Correct me if I'm wrong, please. Now, the mother goddess, Mami, 
kind of reminds me of Miami, is assigned the task of creating humans by shaping clay figurines mixed with the flesh and blood of the slain god, Geshtu E, a god who had intelligence. His name means ear or wisdom. All the gods, in turn, spit upon the clay. After ten months, a specially made womb breaks open, and humans are born. Woohoo! Tablet One continues with legends about overpopulation and plagues. The Atrahasis is mentioned at the end of Tablet One. So, fascinating. Now, it talks about the... Okay, let's get into this for a minute. They shape clay figurines with the flesh and blood of a slain god. I'm thinking of DNA. I'm thinking of cloning. I'm thinking of literally physical flesh, DNA, being used in this experiment. Now, then it says... All the gods in turn spit on the clay. Well, that makes me think they they did a little bit more than spit. They spit something on the clay. Hello. And it wasn't just clay, folks. Okay, it wasn't just clay. Or was it? Are we just clay? With Anunnaki DNA? I don't think so. I'm sure <laughs> I mean I look outside and I watch The Walking Dead when I go to the store or when I just look outside my window and there's somebody mowing their lawn or something like that. It's Pretty much like watching The Walking Dead when you see people talk at a convenience store or in the mall or if you overhear somebody at the restaurant. It's basically like The Walking Dead. Now, then after 10 months, a specially made womb breaks open and humans are born. Test tube babies. Even in the pillaged King James Version Bible or the New international version Bible or whatever version Abrahamic Bible you want to read that isn't straight from Hebrew. Even the Hebrew versions, in my opinion, point to extraterrestrial influence on mankind, on humankind. Multiple tablets, the flood story, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Now, I'm going to go ahead and read to you guys the Atrahasis, 4,000-year-old, heavily suppressed gems of antiquity. Now, here's another thing, too, is this information, you've got so many different people claiming that either the translations are correct and that when you read about the Anunnaki and the the fallen ones, the ones that come down from heaven, from space. You've got two sides of thought here, two aspects. You know, you can talk to people that say, "Oh, this is this is related to astrology. There's no such thing as aliens." And some people look at this more in a actual account of what took place. You just have to know how to read the fine print, I guess you could say, and put yourself in that person's shoes at that particular time and see what that person has seen, and with the information you have, be able to decipher it and come up with your own conclusion. I think there's, the more research I do, folks, I did my best to to stay agnostic to this as long as possible, and the more research I do, the more I feel that the Anunnaki is an extraterrestrial race that has manipulated mankind. I don't think they made us completely. Absolutely not. I feel that our DNA has been manipulated and tampered, and I certainly don't know if I feel that Enki came here to help us or if he came here to do his job. That, And then he realized, you know, he kind of grew a conscience and said, wait a second, these beings are... These are sovereign beings that we're manipulating for our agenda. And, you know, imagine you were in his position that you went, to, let's let's say you had an opportunity to go to another planet, you're a geneticist, and you're tired of doing all the work, so you get together with your co-workers and compadres and say, hey, look, see those 
See those beans out there? They look smart, right? Well, why don't we get them to do the work for us? We'll just genetically tamper with them a little bit. And then we can go do other things. And then you guys go ahead and do it. And you, you, know, we, you genetically manipulate some beans to have some incredible... I, I shouldn't even say incredible. You, you manipulate some beans that were already on their own sovereign path to divinity. Their own natural path of evolution. And I certainly don't follow the official Darwinian evolution theory. There might be some bits and pieces of it that are accurate. I haven't dove into it deep enough to give you a full analysis on it. I certainly just don't feel that we came from a single organism a few billion years ago, and now here we are after all these cells breaking into other cells and other cells and mutating, etc. And I'm digressing. So, Enki, maybe. You know, he's, he's playing ball with his co-workers, his family members, his his kin. And then his conscience says, look, man, we can't do this to these people. Or, or, or if you're going to do this, you have, to, you have to put something else in their DNA so they can get out of it eventually and find their own path again. You know, maybe Enki embedded certain codes in the DNA that could be reactivated either by the user or by Enki himself at some point in time. You know, if we were manipulated, you guys, by extraterrestrials, well, wouldn't it be safe to say that they could probably do something to where they could see through our eyes, they could smell through our nose, they could feel through our body, they could hear through our ears? Literally, we're like walking modems, possibly, for these guys. Now, another thing that I've noticed too. I mean, let's let's just I want to show you some images. Here's Gilgamesh. Okay, this is a image of Gilgamesh. Look like you see how much bigger he is than the lion, and he's holding a lion like it's just a, a cute little kitty cat, like a domesticated cat. Well, I'll bet you these Anunnaki, because especially with all the Sumerian tablets that I've been looking at and all these carvings that are thousands of years old, I think they're huge. I think they're a lot bigger than we than most people will think of the Anunnaki as. 30 feet, 35 feet, maybe even bigger. I was going through a whole bunch of images on Pine Rest that showed these just monolithic structures in the Middle East and the stairs, each stair, each step was like, I don't know, 10, 15 feet? I mean, why would they build an enormous megalithic structure like that with 15-foot steps for the fun of it? Or just to look cool. Hey, look what we can do, guys. We've got 15-foot steps. Yours are only 5 feet. <laughs> We're cooler than you. I-, I doubt it. I could be wrong. So here's Gilgamesh. Here is Enki and the dragon with wings. I think there was a lot of DNA manipulation going on back then, especially when you read the Epic of Gilgamesh and it talks about the uh, Ishtar and the different animals and lizards and reptiles and all that kind of stuff. I I feel that was genetic manipulation, especially when you look at all these um, carvings and statues and you'll see lion heads and wings and reptile heads and wings. Here is a common theme, though. Here's something that I've noticed a lot. Look at the bottom of this image here where Enlil is actually holding, looks like a a lunch pill, right? You see that in various carvings and sculptures, a lot of them, whether it's Enki or Enlil or various other factors of the Anunnaki, even the reptilian people. I've done a whole bunch of research. I found dozens of of carvings that were found in a graveyard in Iraq. 7,000-year-old serpent beings. Lizard people. And they looked nice. They looked friendly. Like they were, uh, one of them was a mom nursing her baby. You know, I mean, how much more motherly can you get than that? And yet, a lot of times, and I've been guilty of this before too, you look at that image and you get freaked out because it's this giant reptile being and our, 
our minds oftentimes when we think of reptiles, it, it freaks a lot of people out. I've never been scared of reptiles. I've always been fascinated with reptiles. I think they're awesome. So, and that's another thing too. If there is an, a reptilian agenda, if there really are reptilian shapeshifters that walk amongst us. I just read an article a couple days ago about um, some actress that shapeshifted into an eight-foot reptile in front of a dozen fans behind the scenes. This came out in some Australian newspaper, and then it was retracted. And it might be BS. It most likely is. Let's use Occam's razor here. But what if there's that 1% chance that that actually did happen? And that many of these entertainers and political leaders and people in specific positions, maybe they are reptilian shapeshifters. Or maybe there's reptilian shapeshifters that control them in a different frequency. I don't know. I don't know. I'll tell you this much, though. There's enough evidence out there to make me do a double take on it and to make me research it more. And there's certainly enough evidence out there that shows that the people before the flood were really fascinated with reptilian beings, with these beings that were half man, half bull. Hello. If some people would have, you know, wings and, and different animal parts and lizard parts and, you know, let's, let's, let's do some more um, digging here. Look at this. Look at this. Is this Enki and Enlil? Is that the tree of life? Is that some type of stargate? Because right above that, you see you've got the, the flying ship. Or is that all just symbolic, ladies and gentlemen? And these Sumerians just had amazing imaginations for sci-fi. Look at this. Look at these reptile dudes. This is thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. You've got that Anunnaki-looking spaceship thingy. You've got that planet deal right there, or maybe that's, some people think that's Nibiru. I am still very, very, very skeptical about Nibiru. I think Nibiru could be something completely different, but hey, I don't know. Maybe it's a, maybe it is an artificial planet. Who knows? Well, look at these things. Look at all these dudes. They're all reptiles. And then you got the owl right there. That's a sign of knowledge. That's a sign of, of, of seeing through the spirit world even, very powerful. Look at these reptile-looking dudes or whatever these guys are. Very unique-looking carving in stone thousands of years ago, pre-flood. Look at these dudes. These are all Sumerians. You notice how some faces are round, some faces are long, huge eyes. Stuff's like 4,000 years old approximately, you guys. Or how about the fish people? Even the Pope has the fish hat. Mermaids. Mermen. Here's what I think. I think these very intelligent beings, the Anunnaki, I think they came to Earth and they had so many scientists and, and just very brilliant minds that have been tinkering with genetics and stuff like that for who knows how long. And they get to Earth, and they're like, look at this cornucopia of, this is like, like to, to those guys, it's like an open canvas where they can do whatever they want. So what do they do? Well, it's, we're, we're better than these guys because we have more technology, so they're not as superior as we are. So let's, let's take those genetics and mix them with over here so we can create wings on this dude. I mean, you see images of Enki and Enlil having their heads on lions and stuff like that. Look at this thing. I mean, what in the heck is this? Okay, so first of all, it looks like a that looks like Buddha or some type of Buddha type statue on the foot of this enormous creature. But if that's Buddha, then how long has Buddha been around, and how long has that archetype been around pre Buddha? You know, Krishna. Does it go before that? Even some people talk connections to the the Egyptian gods, Isis, Osiris, Ra etc. But look at the size of the people in the background compared to this enormous being. And people say, well, would see, would see skeletons, would see skeletons, would have skeletons all over the place. Well, you guys got to remember, there's enormous corporations slash institutions, let's say institutions like the Smithsonian, with the money that funds the Smithsonian, 
and institutions like the Smithsonian, they can get this, they can get this stuff and rebury it in their vaults before most of us will ever even see it. And then I'm sure a lot of uh, private collectors and, and very prestigious people and government officials can have access to this kind of stuff. And also those that maybe go to college for this can get a part of a program and do some research and stuff like that. But it's usually not readily available to the masses. And you really have to do your digging for it. And the great thing about the internet now is a lot of people like you, like me, and like others that listen to Leak Project can have access to this kind of stuff if we just go digging for it. This is pretty powerful stuff right here. So you can read the Epic of Gilgamesh yourself online, the Atrahasis as well. And I'm going to go ahead now and read to you guys the Atrahasis. Hold on a second. Let me show you a few more of these, these reptilian-looking statues. Like, look at this guy. Look at the one on the bottom left. He looks like he's happy to see me. Bingo! Look at this. Credo Mutwa. That is his name. I've mispronounced it several times. I feel really bad about that. Credo Mutwa. I want to get this guy on the League Project. He knows a lot about the reptilian agenda. He's a part of a, a secret society that has information that's been passed on for, for thousands of years. And I would love to get this guy on the show. But this was that one image I was talking about of a, a carving, 7,000-year-old carving in Iraq. It was found in a graveyard in Iraq of a reptilian holding its child. And if that statue freaks you out, as mellow as that statue is, imagine seeing an eight-foot reptilian in front of you. Even if it was waving at you saying hello, and you were somebody that was packing. Like, let's say you live somewhere that... <laughs> Never mind, I'm not even going to get into that. But let's say you were, you know, you were uh, carrying because you got a permit. And let's say you are, are walking to your car and all of a sudden you see this eight-foot reptilian right in front of you. If it was waving at you saying, hello, how are you? I'm your friend. Would it freak you out? Would you like, what would you do? I don't know. It's like no wonder they don't show themselves if they are real. Aliens. I'm not saying aliens did it. I'm just saying aliens probably did it. This thing looks weird. I don't know what this is. It's like, it almost looks more of a, a spiritual type thing, but I don't know. So, okay, I'm going to go ahead now and read this to you guys. Hopefully you're still with me. I haven't lost you yet. All right. The Epic of Atrahasis. Now, I'll give you a quick summary. You've got the conditions immediately after the creation. The lower gods have to work very hard, and they start to complain. They, rev they, revolt, to the, uh, they revolt, then negotiations with the great gods are made, then they propose to make humans, then they create man, then man has noisy behavior, complains, to the gods, and then complaints from the gods. The supreme god Enlil's decision to extinguish mankind by a great flood. So Enlil is the one that decides to extinguish mankind by a great flood. Well, isn't it Yahweh of the Old Testament that does that? Are they one and of the same? Or is it all just a conspiracy, ladies and gentlemen? Atrahasis is warned in a dream. Enki explains the dream to Atrahasis and betrays the plan. So, of course, Enki warns mankind, and now he's the bad guy. He's the son of a gun. He's the Bin Laden type archetype. I'm just using that archetype. I don't know why I use that, but it just seems like, who knows what Bin Laden actually is. I've heard that he's a CIA asset. I certainly don't have any good thoughts for that guy by any means. I just feel that he was used as a scapegoat or a boogeyman. 
And that's what I mean in reference to that. So you've got the, the construction of the ark, the boarding of the ark, the departure, the great flood. Then the gods are hungry because there's no farmers left to bring sacrifices and decide to spare Atrahasis, even though he's a rebel. And then regulations to cut down the noise, childbirth, infant mortality. Now, the translation offered that I'm going to read to you is adapted from the one by B.R. Foster. Here we go. Let me get a, a drink here. <coughs> Excuse me. Complaints of the lower gods. When the gods were man, they did forced labor. They bore drudgery. Great indeed was the drudgery of the gods. The forced labor was heavy, the misery too much. The seven great and new gods were burdening the Agigi gods with forced labor. The gods were digging water courses, canals they opened, the life of the land. The Agigi gods were digging water courses, canals they opened, the life of the land. The Agigi gods dug the Tigris River and the Euphrates thereafter. Springs they opened from the depths, wells they established. They heaped up all the mountains, years of drudgery, the vast marsh. They counted years of drudgery and forty years too much. Forced labor, they bore night and day. They were complaining, denouncing, muttering down in the ditch. Let us face up to our foreman, the perfect. He must take off our heavy burden upon us. Enlil, counselor of the gods, the warrior, come, let us remove him from his dwelling. Enlil, counselor of the gods, the warrior, come. Let us remove him from his dwelling. Now then, call for battle. Battle, let us join. Warfare. The gods heard his words. They set fire to their tools. They put fire to their spaces and flame to their work baskets. Off they went, one and all, to the gate of the warrior and Lil's abode. Insurrection of the lower gods. It was night, halfway through the watch. The house was surrounded, but the god did not know. It was night, halfway through the watch. Ikur was surrounded, but Enlil did not know. The great gods send a messenger. Nusku opened his gate, took his weapon, and went. Enlil, in the assembly of all the gods, he knelt, stood up, expounded the command, Anu, your father, your counselor, the warrior, and Lil, your perfect Ninurta, and your Belith and Ugi have sent me to say, Who is the instigator of this battle? Who is the instigator of these hostilities? Who declared war? That battle has run up the gate of Enlil. In. He transgressed the command of Enlil. Reply by the lower gods. Every one of us gods has declared war. We have set un the excavation. Excessive drudgery has killed us. Our forced labor was heavy, the misery too much. Now every one of us gods has resolved on a reckoning with Enlil. The great gods decide to create man to relieve the lower gods from their misery. Proposals by Ea, Balat Ali, and Enki. Ea made ready to speak and said to the gods, his brothers, What calumny do we lay to their charge? Their forced labor was heavy, their misery too much. Every day the outcry was loud. We could hear the clamor. There is Belit Ali, the midwife is present. Let her create, then, a human, a man. Let him bear the yoke. Let him bear the yoke. Let man assume the drudgery of the god. Belit Ali, the midwife, 
is present. Let the midwife create a human being. Let man assume the drudgery of the god. They summoned and asked the goddess, the midwife of the gods, wise mommy. Will you be the birth goddess, creatress of mankind? Create a human being that he bear the yoke. Let him bear the yoke, the task of Enlil. Let man assume the drudgery of the god. Nintu made ready to speak and said to the great gods, It is not for me to do it. The task is Enki's. He is that cleanses all. Let him provide me the clay so I can do the making. Enki made ready to speak. And said to the great gods, On the first, seventh, and fifteenth days of the month, let me establish a purification, a bath. Let one god be slaughtered, then let the gods be cleansed by immersion. Let Nintu mix clay with his flesh and blood. Let the same god and man be thoroughly mixed in the clay. Let us hear the drum for the rest of the time. From the flesh of the god, let a spirit remain. Let it make living now it's sign. Let he be allowed to be forgotten. Let the spirit remain. The great Anuna gods who administer destinies. Answered yes in the assembly. Okay, I want to take a pause here for a minute. Let's go back for a second. Enki says, let one god be slaughtered. Then let the gods be cleansed by immersion. And then he goes on to say, let Nintu mix clay with his flesh and blood. So once again, I don't think that's clay, folks. They're mixing genetics with flesh and blood, blood of a slain Anunnaki. So why do they decide to, to slaughter that specific god? And once again, take out the word god and just put in you know, being from another planet and... It's one and of the same. These texts completely shatter the Abrahamic paradigm, Christianity system that's fit into this cute little package of 66 books, in my opinion. That's my opinion. Now, a lot of people are going to listen to this and say that I am a devil worshiper because I don't follow the official version or their version, not even the official version. I just don't follow their version of religion. I mean, I get more attacks from people that say they're devout Christians because of my readings that I do in the Nag Hammadi scriptures when I talk about Gnostic texts, which these Gnostic texts, the people that wrote them very much so believe in the Christ and Jesus Christ, yet they don't know enough or about it to give a solid opinion, so they just attack. Or they know enough about it, and they don't agree with it, and they give me an attack anyway. Hey, and that's cool. I appreciate that. Water off a duck's back, buddy. Let's get back to work here. The creation of man. On the first, seventh, and fifteenth days of the month, he established a purification of bath. They slaughtered Ah Elu, who had the inspiration in their assembly. Nintu mixed clay with his flesh and blood. The same God and man were thoroughly mixed in the clay. For the rest of the time, they would hear the drum from the flesh of the God. The spirit remained. It would make the living know its sign. Lest he be allowed to be forgotten, the spirit remained. After she had mixed the clay, she summoned the Anuna, the great gods, the Igigi, the great gods, spat upon the clay. Mommy made Raddy to speak and said to the great gods, You ordered me the task, and I have completed it. You have slaughtered the god along with his inspiration. I have done away with your heavy forced labor. I have imposed your drudgery on man. You have bestowed clamor upon mankind. I have released the yoke. I have made restoration. They heard 
this speech of hers. They ran free of care and kissed her feet, saying, Formally, we used to call you Mommy. Now let your name be Belit Kala Ali. The human population increases. Their noise disturbs the gods who decide to wipe out mankind. The god Enki, however, sends a dream to Atrahasis. When the text resumes, Enki is still speaking. Enki explains Atrahasis' dream. Enlil committed an evil deed against the people. Atrahasis made ready to speak and said to his lord, Make me know the meaning of the dream. Let me know that I may look out for its consequence. Enki made ready to speak and said to his servant, You might say, Am I to be looking out while in the bedroom? Do you pay attention to message that I speak for you? Wall, listen to me. Read, Wall, pay attention to all my words. Flee the house, build a boat, forsake possessions, and save life. The boat which you build be equal. Roof over, roof her over like the depth, so that the sun shall not see inside her. Let her be roofed over, fore and aft. The gear should be very strong. The pitch should be firm, and so give the boat strength. I will shower down upon you later a windfall of birds, a spate of fishes. He opened the water clock and filled it. He told it of the coming of the seven-day deluge. Deluge. Atrahasis and the elders. Atrahasis received the command. He assembled the elders at the gate. Atrahasis made ready to speak and said to the elders, My God does not agree with your God. Enki and Enlil are constantly angry with each other. They have expelled me from the land. Since I have always reverenced Enki, he told me this, I can not live in, nor can I set my feet on earth of Enlil. I will dwell with my God in the depths. This he told me. Construction of the Ark The Elders the carpenter carried his axe, the reed worker carried his stone, the rich man carried the pitch, the poor man brought the materials needed. La Suna of about fifteen lines, the word Atrahasis can be discerned. Boarding of the ark, bringing, whatever he had, whatever he had, pure animals he slaughtered, cattle, fat animals he killed, sheep he chose and he brought on board, the birds flying in the heavens, the cattle and the of the cattle god. The creatures of the steep he brought on board. He invited his people to a feast. His family was brought on board while one was eating and another was drinking. He went in and out. He could not sit, could not kneel, for his heart was broken. He was retching gall. Departure. The outlook of the weather changed. A dad began to roar in the clouds. The god they heard his clamor. He brought pitch to seal his door. By the time he had bolted the door, a dad was roaring in the clouds. The winds were furious as he set forth. He cut the mooring rope and released the boat. The Great Flood. The storm were yoked. Anzu rent the sky with his talons, he the land, and broke its clamor like a pot. The flood came forth, its power came upon the people like a battle. One person did not see another. They could not recognize each other in the catastrophe. The deluge blowed like a bull. The wind resounded like a screaming eagle. The darkness was dense. The sun was gone like flies. The clamor of the deluge. Lasuna the gods find themselves hungry because there are no farmers left and sacrifices are no longer brought. When they discover that Atrahasis had survived, they made a plan, making sure that the noise will remain within limits. So they invent childbirth, infant mortality, and celibacy. Mankind punished. Enki made ready to speak and said to Nintu, the birth goddess, you, birth goddess, creatress of destinies, establish death for all peoples. Now then, let there be a third woman among the people. Among the people are the woman who is born, and the woman who has not born. Let there be also among the people 
the Pasitu, meaning she-demon. Let her snatch the baby from the lap who bore it and establish high priestess and priestesses. Let them be taboo. And so, cut down childbirth. End of line. Now, that in and of itself, in my opinion, was extremely powerful text because, first of all, you can think about the secret book of John, talking about Yah the Both and all the archons and the way that they created Adam and Eve. And symbolically speaking, it's very similar to this story. The Abrahamic version has a ton of parallels to this story. There's so many scriptures, even, even carvings and statues and evidence, in my opinion, this could be a very good analogy or storyline of the manipulation of mankind. Reminds me a little bit of the film Prometheus when these astronauts discover that these beings had a huge impact on the manipulation of man. You could look at them as the Anunnaki. H.R. Giger was way ahead of his time. That guy, in my opinion, was tapping into the other side or some other dimensions or some other parts of the universe and bringing in a lot of extraterrestrial type information through his artwork. He was uh, a big. He had a big influence on the film Alien, Aliens. His work is nothing short of extraordinary, and he's no longer with us in physical form. I wonder where he's at right now. If you guys believe in the afterlife or whatnot, be interesting to to think about where that guy went, just based upon where he was here, you know, while he was around. It's fascinating indeed. So here's what really stands out to me, though. At the very end here, it says, Mankind's punished. So, Enki says to Nintu, establish death for all people. So, that makes me think of, okay, well, we need to create these these beings to have a, a shorter lifespan. Because it sounds to me like at first, maybe they, there was no lifespan. Because the, the DNA, you guys, if you look at the DNA, the DNA is designed to age. It's designed to age. Bingo, that could be the answer right there, literally, in the Atrahasis. A 4,000-year-old story that could be based on stories older than that. Pre-flood times are fascinating, aren't they? If you really think about the stuff that took place pre-flood and the creatures that walked the earth, the um, here is Anu. Here's an image of Anu, the Sumerian god, and according to this, He represents the constellation of Orion with the symbol of the northern half of the constellation of Orion on his head, the all-seeing eye. Now, I don't know if I believe that 100% or not, but that's a cool theory right there. And we sure don't hear a whole lot about Anu. We hear a lot more about Enki and Enlil, it seems like, which I, I find is interesting because Anu is the father, correct? So, And Gilgamesh. I sure would like to know a whole lot more about Gilgamesh. I wish we could find more information on this guy. Um, I would like to know more about the genetic manipulation that went on back then. And if you think of the Cylons, how they could just upload their consciousness into different bodies, I wouldn't doubt if the Anunnaki can do that. And maybe, just think about this, if these guys are so ahead of their time with genetics that they could manipulate, like they could make a bean that's got the body of a bull and the the head of a Anunnaki member, okay? Well, what if they could transfer their consciousness into that being at any given time and also still be a part of their one body? Kind of like I was talking about at the beginning of this presentation where if they did have uh, a hand in manipulating us and our DNA, how easy would it be for them to put some type of switch in our body to be able to see through our eyes? And then you think about these bloodlines that have controlled very large parts of the world, whether it be in politics or government or, or corporations, and you can take these bloodlines back to the pharaohs of, of Egypt and pre-pharaohs and specific DNA. 
well, maybe this specific DNA is easier to control by these guys because of these switches. And the blood types, I do feel, have a very big impact on your physiological makeup. That is your fuel that drives you. Doesn't mean you're good or bad if you have a particular blood type by any means. Far from it. You guys, I know people personally that have woke up with six fingers with, with like with a mark on their side and I've got pictures of this of six fingers that have been abducted and had interactions with the paranormal their entire lives going all the way back before their grandparents RH negative blood the aristocratic bloodlines you it's all there there's so much stuff I know that I don't share with you guys on the show. It's mind-boggling. It is absolutely mind-boggling. The hair is literally standing up on my body right now just thinking about it. It's insane. Welcome to the New World Order, ladies and gentlemen. They love us so much. Why did they slay that guy? Why did they pick that one dude and say, let's take that guy's body and slaughter him and take his DNA and make man with it? Was he considered inferior? Was he considered, like, was that his punishment? Did he do something against the establishment? And then you can get even deeper into these religions that, you know, the Eucharist, for example, the drinking of blood and eating of flesh of the Christ. I've heard that a man connects with the sun god Ra, which also might connect with Enlil. I'm still doing more research on this. What I have found out, that is if you say amen, it is also a representation of when you're done with your prayer, you're saying that prayer in silence. I know some people will finish their prayer with um or you And some people choose to use the term amen. That's totally cool. However, what are you praying to? What are you worshiping? And why does God demand worship? The creator of all, the knowing of everything, omnipotent, omnipowerful. Why would the creation of everything that knows what's going to happen before it happens create something destined for destruction, destined for pain and suffering? I don't know. What do you think, ladies and gentlemen? And what in the heck is up with that lunchbox-looking thing there? So many of these statues and carvings have that. There's got to be something more than just, you know, he's carrying his lunch with him. (laughs) If you haven't subscribed to our website yet, leakproject.com, we've got 700-plus full-featured podcasts, downloadable, streamable, ad-free, And it's 50 bucks for the entire year to be a premium member. You'll get access to exclusive content. Or you can do it for 10 bucks a month. Or if you don't have a lot of money and you want to listen to the shows, the shows are always free at youtube.com slash clandestine timelord. You will get access to exclusive stuff on Leak Project. And your contributions absolutely help Leak Project grow. Also, support our sponsors, givethetea.com. I've been taking these essential bees and this colostrum. And I feel like priceless. I was going to say a million bucks, but I feel a lot better than that. And it's it's about 11 o'clock right now. And I feel like I just had three cups of coffee. And I didn't. So I love this stuff. It's great for energy. And I've also noticed the colostrum helps my body digest food really good. So anyway, that is my shameless plug, ladies and gentlemen. Hope to see you at X-Fest, May 19th through 21st, South Dakota, Fort Igloo area, not far from the Black Hills. Sturgis, the Badlands, Mount Rushmore, Keystone, Deadwood, Crazy Horse, Devil's Tower. It's awesome out there. Hope to see you. Have a beautiful day. Question everything and be the change you want to see.